costs? Friday nights. You will. This Friday and every Friday, Fox Family brings you episodes of the scariest places on Earth. We're daring families to spend the night in the world's most haunted locations. Join host Linda Blair for the scariest places on Earth every Friday at 9, 8 central. Fox Family. It's something to scream about. into a cold sweat. Your heart begins to pound. You are afraid. A special home video edition of scariest places on Earth, including a bridge of terror. A lot of strange things have happened out at the Bunny Man Bridge. A dormitory Possessed. You hear it? You hear a happy <laughs> The most haunted Spanish mission. Does the boogeyman exist? Or is the boogeyman just an expression of our imagination and fears? Well, in Fairfax County, Virginia, they swear he's real. Well, the Bunny Man Bridge is located in Fairfax County. It's down a back road, and we have several different legends that go along with that underpass. The Bunny Man, truth or urban legend? The legend of the Bunny Man Bridge is probably, if not an urban myth, a suburban myth. But from what I understand, a lot of strange things have happened out at the Bunny Man Bridge. After the Civil War, this area started becoming more populated, and eventually they put in an insane asylum. The people in the community decided that they did not want to live near an insane asylum, and the lawmakers forced the asylum to close down. So the move was finally done in 1904, and uh, while they were in transit, many of them escaped into the woods. But two of them were not captured. One was Marcus Walster, and the other was Douglas Griffin. The only trace they found of them is half-eaten bunnies, mutilated bunnies. After that, they found Marcus, and he was dead, hung from the bridge. They didn't find Mr. Griffin. They assumed he was dead, but the dead and mutilated bunnies continued to be found, and people started calling him the Bunny Man. Since 1905, 28 deaths have occurred at Bunny Man Bridge. The teenagers probably should not be there for their own safety. We don't know what, in fact, occurred down there, what, in fact, is the truth, and what, in fact, has been made up. But it's probably not the safest place for them to go. You know, there are uh, stories about this legend that are true, some are true, some are not. I heard he was a uh, guy out in Clifton who, uh, for some reason, flipped out, killed his parents. And, you know, people say that he took the bodies back to this bridge, which is now called Bunny Man Bridge. And there used to be vines that would hang down, and he would hang the children from the bridge. They know about it from their parents and their families and their friends, and they're exaggerating. If someone asked me to come out to Bunny Man Bridge, I'd say, no way, dude, go by yourself. I think that there's a truth to every urban legend. I, I think I think it did happen, and the question is whether or not he's still out there. Strong evidence has led many to believe in the legend. The surveillance camera that is posted is intended to catch teenagers getting into trouble, but it may, in fact, capture other phenomenon going on down there. Six local residents go in search of the truth behind the Bunny Man legend. The Bunny Man Bridge can be a very scary place. 
It's a creepy place, especially at night. Most definitely, I will be scared. I will be scared. I have no idea what I might see tonight. This is the site of the old insane asylum. This is where the legend of the bunny man started. In 1943, when Halloween night came, some of the teenagers, I don't know how many, showed up at the bridge, and just in a few seconds, those three teenagers, two men and a young woman, were killed. Their bodies were slashed open. And the two men were hung at one end of the bridge, and the woman hung at the other. In 1974, six young people were killed at that bridge. If you go there at night, you can feel the death presence. You can feel it waiting for the next blood. The group sets out to learn if the stories are real. Okay, we're going to um, go out in the woods and we're gonna walk around where the bunny man hung out when they were looking for him. Great people. A lot of people believe, by the way, that he did a lot of his hanging around near the old insane asylum, his home, that he'd been kicked out of. I suppose, in a sense, his spirit still walks this area. Oh, sick. Oh, my God. Oh, God, that's disgusting. This Did you guys hear that? Oh, oh my God. What is that? Did anybody see anything? Yeah, it was like yeah, right there. The terrified group searches for further evidence to validate the myth. This is the home of Janet Chaltier, the only survivor of the bunny man. 1985, Janet Chaltier and four of her friends went to the Bunny Bridge. Janet started to get very upset. She decided to leave, turned to run, ran in, right into a one of her friends who was hanging from the bridge. And every year, she felt whatever had left her alive was going to get her. Is there a presence in the house? Okay, we're gonna go down the stairs. <laughs> this oh is... A disturbance draws the group to the basement. No, we're not doing it. feel this kind of a presence of death. To test the myth of the bunny man, one of them must enter the tunnel alone. By myself? Bunny man! Bunny 
I'm not doing this. The legend of the bunny man lives on. I will never go back. The weirdest noise isn't like we're all freaked out. So this is some scary stuff. <laughs> I'm never going back to the Bunny Man Bridge ever again. I definitely um, experienced some unexplained phenomena. A little bit of it has been uncovered. I have respect for it now, more so, but yeah, totally. I will never come back. Freshman students at Ohio University found out that although everything looked innocent on the outside, on the inside, this college campus harbored a history of horror. According to the British Society for Psychical Research, the 13th most haunted place on Earth is Athens, Ohio. I think it's the combination of things here in Athens. You have strange things, ghosts, a poltergeist activity. The room with the 666. Wait a minute, let me figure this out. Yeah. A spooky cemetery. You throw in a crying angel, uh, a haunted mental health center, uh, residence halls that uh, have ghostly inhabitants walking the halls at night, and you end up with a pretty, pretty spooky but pretty special place. <laughs> I can't name one person I know on, on campus, and I've know quite a few people that haven't had some experience or know someone that's had an experience. People started telling me, oh, you live in the haunted room in Wilson Hall. Lights, curling irons, radios, all would go on and off on their own. You can hear what sounds like marbles going across the ceiling. All this strange stuff started happening. Uh, things started flying around the room. You couldn't really even make out her face, but you could see through her. Sometimes we'd hear rattling inside. There was a distinct sound of somebody or something moving things around in the room that we had just come out of. I decided not to stay in my room anymore. I stayed with friends. I've met a couple people that have felt very uncomfortable here from the start and said that they will never, ever set foot in Athens, Ohio again. You'll be surprised how many people call you and say, oh, you won't believe what's going on in our hall right now. The spook file is a collection of newspaper and eyewitness accounts of unexplained events in Athens. The spook file is the most heavily used item in our department. Yes, there are all kinds of unusual events and unexplained events that may be paranormal. And there are certainly a lot of unexplained events that uh, never end up with any resolution. Documents in the spook file reveal a disturbing link between five local cemeteries and the town of Athens. When these five cemeteries are connected, they form a pentagram around the city of Athens with the center of this being at the very center of campus. As you branch out, you begin to hit residence halls and other, the, the ridges, the mental health center, and you hit areas that, uh, that are just chock full, really, of, of ghost stories and of legends behind them. There are several reasons why there's so much stuff going on here, and I'm gonna explain a few of them. I decide to take people out into where it actually happens. Sometimes we see some stuff that we really just can't, can't explain away. In 1873, the Athens Lunatic Asylum opened its doors. The Ridges at Night is, a, I think, a horror movie waiting to happen. Part of me is really excited to go into the Ridges because it's an opportunity that not a lot of people have um, to be able to get in there and explore and see what we can find. And there's so many legends. So originally, when it would open its doors, uh, it was a big sign over the wrought iron facade was the Lunatic Asylum. Now, of course, it has this new name, The Ridges, to help describe, perhaps, its geographic look, a structure of 18 million bricks. And there on the top of this hill are these Victorian, uh, beautiful but very spooky, very unsettling buildings. When you imagine what a 19th century mental hospital would have looked like, this is it. There are some of the rooms you can look through and still see shackles on the wall where the inmates were, were shackled. of Building 18. Everything's connected by either the basements or tunnels, which you see the tunnel going through down at the end of it there. Oh, look at, look at this. New patients, records 1943, 1945. 
4648. The asylum was a regular stop for physicians who conducted extreme medical procedures. He was known as Dr. Lobotomy. He would travel around the country in, in, in a station wagon and his little tools, you know, his, his ice picks. And this guy could do up to 20 lobotomies a day because it would only take 30, 40 seconds to run that ice pick through somebody's temple and spin it around a little bit and destroy the front hole lobes. And then off he'd go. Disappeared. They searched the institution three times, couldn't find her anywhere. The family had missed her and inquired as to where she was. So they had made searches, and, and I guess they had made several searches, you know, like in two-week intervals, but they, they never found her. Sometimes you'll actually look up there and you'll see the window, and they see something peering down upon them, uh, which obviously creeps anyone out. Many people report an apparition. And in this one window, you could just barely see a presence. I promise you, I know it sounds exaggerated, but you could tell there was something up there. Year after year after year of sightings of uh, a woman moving from room to room um, through the windows. Let's go see what's going on. He's around the corner. I thought he went over here. Kevin? When the missing woman's body was eventually found, it had left a bizarre imprint. And she come over, possibly, to look out the window. Maybe to see somebody to yell for help. But she took her clothes off and folded them real neatly and stacked them in the window. And then she laid down here. One night she was asleep. She opened her eyes and saw a face floating level with her head. It was a woman's face. This of, course, this, of course, freaked her out greatly, really frightened her. No one heard anything for uh, three or four days. They went in to check on, on the student to see, to see what was wrong. She had killed herself in Wilson Hall. Ever since then, it has really held the reputation as the most haunted place on campus. Most people will never get the chance to see what you guys are about to see. What we're going to do is, again, we're right here at, at the gateway to Wilson. Uh, the most haunted room on campus is just four flights of stairs straight up. All right, All right let's head on up. Like I said, four flights right up here is... We've had several students with a lot of what I've heard referred to as like a psychic slap in the face where you walk into a place and you're hit by something that makes your hair stand on the edge and puts you in a really uneasy, uneasy state. Creepy building in it's, it is, it is, you're absolutely right. Right here through this door is, uh, is pretty much right where it happens. This is the hallway where uh, most of the ghostly activity is centered. You guys ready? Yeah. I said, we've looked out. I've got the key. Uh, I got the key from the university to, to open the, the door here. Uh, come on up here, and I'll show you guys something on the door, and then we'll, we'll fill you in on the story a little bit more. This is the door where people say that sometimes you can see a, an outline of a demonic face take place. It's in the wood grain. Let's see if we can see it. It's a little. Yeah, right here. See the oh eyes? My God. Do you see it, Amy? Yes. Do you see it? Do you see it? Yes. Horns right here. Oh, the geez. eyes. Oh. It's right there. Right there. Here's the, oh here's the story. There was a student. She, uh, she was into practicing the black arts, whether it was uh, some sort of perverted witchcraft or, or demonic worship, we don't know. 
But very soon after she moved in, people on the floor began witnessing very strange phenomena. At night, they would hear chanting coming from within the room, chanting in strange, guttural, growling sounds. Books would fall off of bookshelves, uh, brushes would fly across the room, doors would slam themselves shut with no wind. Following that point, that night of terror where no one could sleep, they didn't hear from her again. Three or four days later, the RA, the resident assistant, became concerned and keyed into the room to find that she had committed suicide. But before she had done that, she had smeared symbols and words all over the walls in her own blood. After that, the university cleaned up the room and the students, uh, new students moved in the next year. But sure enough, they weren't in the room but a few days when things began to move. Doors would slam, drawers would open and shut. And right there on the wall, that red blood began to seep through coat after coat of paint. And that happened no matter how many times they painted it over. Eventually, no one would live in the room. So it was turned into a boiler room that we're going to see. We're going in, okay? We're gonna go on in. Okay, come on in. Come on in. If you come right over here, you can see where the wall was taken out. That's the wall that had the blood coming through it. The university, the only way to stop it was to completely destroy the, uh, another door slam. The only way to do it was to completely take out the wall. It was the only way to stop that from coming through. Can we go? Oh, it's just a board. It's a board. It's a board. OK. All right, do you guys want to go? Do you want to get out of here? All right, let's go. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, let's get, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's get out of here. What happened? There was a knock on the door. Yes, on that one. Like a chill, oh my god. Like that. Yeah, I'm breathing so hard right now. She's right here. She's standing right here. <laughs> she got some serious chills. I just want to go. All right. Outside. Okay. All right. Let's let's get the door open and get out of here. Uh, let's get the door open. All right. No. <laughs> no. We need to go. We need to go out this way. We need to go out here. That was not a jingle, that was a yeah. knock. That was a push. Knock. I didn't hear it, I was still that in the back. That was a uh, uh, uh. <sighs> I can't, I can't. <laughs> I'm sweating so Yeah, I, my heart, my, room? my heart is racing. Yeah. That's the room, well, that's the room at the end of the hall right there. You know, you hear stories about stuff that, you know, this room's creepy or whatever, and you show up and it's a room, but mm, that was. It's got something to it. No, yeah, that was, that was definitely one of the, the most chilling places I think I've ever been. Home, generally thought to be the one place in the world we feel most protected and secure. But after the sanctity of an Iowa house was ripped apart by a horrific crime, this once safe family dwelling wasn't so safe anymore. People in Iowa are good people. We all care about each other. We look after each other. Villisca is a beautiful town. But like all small towns, we got our secrets. that night in that house. Nobody deserves to die like that. Speaking of that house, why didn't they just let it go? Why does somebody have to decide to fix it up? In 1994, Darwin Lynn bought the house and began restoring it. After I started working on the house, I did have people have experiences in the house. The pantry seems to have, I don't know what it is, there's a force or something there that creates a real cold, the hair stands up on their arms. 
Oh, I had never been in the house at night by myself. Uh, I, uh, and I've never had any desire to stay in the house. There's something there. Paranormal investigator Dave Christensen examined the house. We've noticed that a lot of times when people move into old houses and start restoring them or remodeling them, a lot of times it awakens a spirit. The first reaction downstairs was fairly normal, just a regular house. The living room and the kitchen were normal. We went upstairs to the second floor. The second floor was really, really cold. I had an uneasy feeling. Monday morning, the 10th of June, 1912, the local town marshal came and went through the house, and he found uh, two girls in the northwest bedroom over here, uh, their heads chopped off with an ax, and found husband and wife, Joe and Sarah Moore, and then in the south bedroom, the four children. They were all killed in the same way. All of them were apparently asleep when they were struck. The killer had picked up an ax in the backyard. All the victims were hit in the head from the chin up. The two adults had been just repeatedly struck. His face was just scooped out and everything was gone. And there were bits and pieces of bone and hair mixed in the bedding. The other one who had been struck most often was the wife, and she had been struck primarily with the blade of the axe, so that the first cuts were above the chin, but the face had been somewhat reduced to slices almost. Some people were crying, some were just quiet, like in shock, I guess. Seemed like they were all scared to death, because it made no sense. Could have been them. I was good friends with two little girls, Lena and Catherine. I saw them the morning before a Sunday school, and all of a sudden, they were gone. It's knowing what happened, knowing what was in there. And when you go in and you sit in the dark, you can feel it. It, it just consumes you. Dave Christensen videotaped ghostly orbs around the beds, which he believes are the victim spirits. Lena? Lena? An orb, sometimes you can see them, most of the time you can't. Some of them are blue, some are red, some are orange different colors of light. Why they're that way, I don't know. It could be because of the person's aura, the energy, the essence of the body that is being transmitted through the air. In 1917, the murder investigation was officially closed. No one was ever charged with the crime. They never caught who did it. But there was that photograph that was taken the day before. He was a stranger. But when I look at that, that photograph, see that man's face, I get a chill. Paranormal activity increased as Dave Christensen continued his investigation. A newspaper reporter from Shenandoah was here. We were showing her around and she was getting ready to go into the attic. And she opened the attic door and she went to step in and something physically pushed her back. I tried to walk into this room and I just couldn't do it. I felt like there was some kind of invisible wall in, in my way blocking me from entering that room. I don't know if it was emotional or what it was or just fear, but I just felt like I couldn't go into this room. A lot of people think he got in the house when they were at church and that he hid in the pantry or, or the attic. But one thing was sure, he was there, waiting for them to fall asleep. One of the first evenings we were here up in the attic, kind of a creepy, eerie feeling for 
good 45 minutes to an hour. It felt like something passed by me. And uh, right after it did, it went bolting past Dave and down the stairway. And it just felt like just an ice cold breeze going through the whole house. I've always been spooked by that house, especially after the restoration. It's just a feeling. Some in Villisca believe the restoration of the house stirred up more than the victim's spirits. They believe the spirit of the killer has also returned. When you're in there and he's in there and he's around you, you can feel him. You can hear him moving around. You can start feeling the energy build. You can start feeling your heart beat faster. You start getting more nervous, more anxious. You start wanting just to get, get out. Velisca lost its innocence that night in 1912. You're never safe in your own bed, in your own house, in your own town. On the shores of Galway Bay in Ireland, the name Burke is legendary. The Burke family built Oranmore Castle 600 years ago, but the British forces drove them out. There has not been a Burke inside Oranmore Castle for more than a century. So when an American descendant of the Burks decided to pay a visit to Oranmore, there was no way to know what would happen. What I have to do, because I live here, is just keep it as calm as possible and try not to sort of interact in my mind. Because the more you think about it, the more things appear. A lot of people have lived there, a lot of people have died there. Oh, it's a, it's, it's a very creepy place. There's a, a chill in the air. Oranmore Castle, a Norman stronghold built in 1177, County Galway, Ireland. Some areas are disturbed spaces. The very first room up has a strange, ghostly, white apparition. She had seen this grotesque manifestation. So I don't go in certain areas of the house if I can possibly help it. Who in their right mind would want to stay in a place like this? Nolan. What's up, brother? What's going on, baby? You ready to do this? I'm ready. I had decided that I wanted to study abroad. I wanted to take some time and, and travel a bit. Let's do it. Right. I had never been to Ireland, and it's, it's a big part of our family life. And I found out that the Ormore Castle was a, a de Burgo castle, which is what Burke used to be uh, in Ireland. I'm visiting the castle of Nolan, but I haven't heard too much about what's going on in the castle. I've heard it was haunted. I'm nervous. I'm, ner I'm nervous. We'll see what happens. The castle has a bloody past. It was a very important castle in those days because it was part of the outer defenses for Galway City. In the 17th century, Ireland was reinvaded by the Cromwellian forces. Over 600,000 people were killed during Oliver Cromwell's 11-year reign of terror. The policy carried out under Cromwell's instructions was to rule by fear and terror. The slaughter was terrible. There's not enough soil to bury them, not enough water to drown them, and not enough trees to hang them. Uh, but they killed everybody that lived in the castle, the, who were the Burks of the time. So check this out. All right, go for it. All right. Mom, Dad, everybody, we're here in Ormore. We made it. There's already some headstones with uh, our family name on it. 
Lord have mercy on the soul of William Burke, who died on September the 9th, 1815. We're surrounded by Burks. This is, this this is pretty amazing. Good one. Yeah. And now we're just gonna go, and we need to find the castle, and uh, I guess we'll take it from there. The locals have their own stories about Orinmore Castle. It's a very, very old uh, building, you know. In the first room up, there was definitely a, a, several friends of mine who had seen a white lady. And then I suddenly felt that there was something creeping down under my arm. And I looked down, and there was just an enormous white spider. And I just screamed, and I just took my hand away, and there was nothing there. Tonight, Sean and I are going to be staying in uh, Orinmore Castle, which we've heard is, you know, has mm -hmm. a bit of a shady past. Uh, are you sure you want to go and stay in the castle? We, we were invited, so I guess... Oh, it's a, it's, it's a very creepy place. There was this old man who lived in the village when I was a child. He used to uh, tell stories about this, this Burke who, who was murdered by his own clan or kinsfolk. He was murdered in the castle or near the castle? Uh, he or... was said to sort of rattle around the place from time to time. The main problem from your point of view, I'd say, is that you're a bark. I think is that bark seem to have, have bad experiences there. It's unbelievable. You getting nervous a little? No? It looks like a prison room, doesn't it? It does. It looks a little bit like a prison. This is very creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this thing. Look at this. I don't know about this. Hello, how are you? Thank you. Nolan and Sean learned the dark history of Orenmore Castle. It was originally built in 1170 by a, a Norman general, de Burgo. The de Burgo Normans became known as Burks. That's where I... That's you guys? Them. Yes, yeah. All right, well... Burke, formerly de Burgo. All oh, right. Well, it's um, a welcome home. Well, yeah. Welcome home. <laughs> My mother started work on restoring it. Uh, they knocked down this bricked-up doorway, only to find the dungeons up there, about ten foot by about four or five feet. And you get dumped down there and left, and you probably most likely die of lack of water. And my godfather discovered a skeleton. There was an iron bond around the skull with two screw bolts in the eye sockets. It was rather a, a gruesome find. There's another room right up at the top, and it has a very unpleasant feeling. I just don't go near it. Uh, so I don't know if, if anyone wants to stay there. You're more than welcome, but um, the last person that slept there, the bedclothes lifted off. Sean and Nolan explore some of the dark corners of the castle. This place is unbelievable. <laughs> Check this out. A local psychic gives the boys a tour of the castle's paranormal history. So last night I tuned into Ormore Castle to focus on the place before I got here. The main thing that you can feel in here is isolation separation, loneliness. It's like there was somebody locked in here for a long time. But the overall feeling here is an emotional feeling of being trapped in. Um, it's very difficult to tell how long ago. It's 
Geraldine leads the boys to the room where they'll spend the night. The whole energy that I saw was very negative. There were people who had taken over the place and they were just um, running riot. And they had people, as I say, kept in chambers around the room to torture them, basically, just for their own enjoyment. So they were disposed of in here, in this corner, where the dungeon ends. The energy there is quite obviously pretty spooky, all right? Spirits can attack in different ways, you know? When you say attack, what, what's, what kind of attack are we talking about? Well, it's like a, a big eagle landing on my back. It's like two claws into the back of my shoulder, and I get a ferocious pain in here. I think I, I went into it feeling better than Sean did, and I think it's kind of, now I don't feel so so good about sleeping here next to the hole for the dungeon, I don't, you know. Nolan and Sean spend a restless night. Right now it's, it's about 2.10 right now. I haven't even go to sleep yet. It's pretty quiet in here right now. All I can hear is, it sounds like, it sounds like some bats around outside. Bats. Bats outside. <laughs> Not keen on sleeping next to the dungeon. Yeah, we got, we got Nolan right here, right? There we go. Here's Nolan. And then see right up there. Yeah, that's the dungeon yeah, right there. That's the dungeon. So I'm going to say right about there in the wall. You know, yeah, yeah, there's, there's a good dead amount dead. of, there's a good amount of skeletons right people. down there. If anything interesting happens, we'll uh, pick up the camera again. All right? Take all the girls in Ireland, put them all together. The girl in love would beat them all in any kind of weather. She doesn't like it. No. The boys decide to investigate the sounds coming from the dungeon. It's cold. No, there's bats in the room. Dude, look at there are there's more than one. Where did all these things come from? Grab a flashlight. Give me that light. No. Can you get down there? God. Look at that down there. Dude, this ladder. There's no way. I don't know if I can do this. This is crazy. How are you going to get it. down don't there? Don't think about it. Just do it. There you go. Can I reach the ground? Yep. Yep. You got it? Just let go with your hands. Let go with your hands. I'm trying to get my foot. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Oh, it looks like a couple bricks have been removed. Try to dig your way out, maybe. What is it? That could be people scratching. Oh my God! Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for sinners now the hour of death. Hour of our death. Amen. Shani, I'm bleeding. Dude, my hand is. I'm bleeding from something. Oh, no, let's go. I'm cut. No, seriously. Shani, let's go, man. Let's, let's, get, let's get out, out of here. here. Dude, hurry! Come on. Seriously, hurry up. Now, Nolan. Now, let's go. Nolan, hurry. Let's go, Nolan. Go. And down the stairs, they came running, turned around, threw up, jumped in a car, and they drove away. That's why none of the Burks ever come into this house. They are unnerved by it, and it seems to unnerve them. I'll we'll stay away from that place in the future. I don't think I'll be uh, heading back no, more yeah, and more no, anytime no, soon. No. I, I looked down at my hand, and, and there was blood on my hand. And then I went and I tried to wipe the blood away, and there was there was nothing 
there was nothing there. There was no cut. There was no. There was no anything. There was no way to explain what had happened. I definitely feel like we interacted with the paranormal. I can honestly say that nothing has ever freaked me out as bad as being in Ormore Castle. What makes a place scary? For the Schilling family of Johnstown, Missouri, it was years of unexplained activity that finally drove them from their home. When the family sought help from paranormal investigators, nothing could have prepared them for what was found. A graveyard of corpses, 148 in all, surrounding their house. Johnstown, Missouri, a house possessed. I did not like that house. I did not want to be there anymore. You feel like you're being watched. It's something you have no control over. This was basically a nightmare, and I couldn't wake up. The history of this place is dark. It's not just dark, it's black. Speaking from a historical point of view, it doesn't surprise me one bit there are mass graves on this property. The Schilling family lived a life of terror in their 19th century farmhouse. We have a home now out in the country that we all, we've always dreamed of, but we didn't count on this. In 1992, over a period of nine years, um, it's been a real nightmare. Things moving, lights being on that were off, footsteps, shadows, and um, the way that it traumatized the children. I would be coming home from cheerleading. Above that front door is a long, skinny window. I always felt like I knew someone was there. I felt a lot like I was, quite a few times, like I was being watched. It was very uneasy getting dressed and getting into a nightgown, you know, or changing clothes. I felt like I was never alone in any one of those rooms, ever, ever. My daughter was hysterical because the flies never stopped. It terrified me. There was a lot of flies, I mean, hundreds of flies. There would just be flies everywhere that would be dead. It was like they were half dead, but yet half alive. Just a swarm of them. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of flies. I couldn't handle it anymore. It was literally driving me crazy. The flies in, in the Johnstown house here clearly indicate that we have supernatural, or if you would like to use the term, demonic activity. Desperate for answers, the Schilling family contacts paranormal expert Brian Lyle. It's not uncommon for uh, families that experience paranormal events like this to not share their stories with one another for, for the purpose of embarrassment and, and maybe denial. We never talked about it. That was a thing in our family. We just never did. I don't know. We just never did. Because I felt confused. I remember feeling very confused. Best thing to do is just forget about it. Talk like nothing happened. In talking about it, there's things now they're starting to remember that they had successfully blocked out because that they, they worked at that so hard to not remember. Talking about it and hearing about it again just is just really difficult. <laughs> Natasha has probably told us a minuscule amount of what she's been through. She finally opened up. She would see this male figure, dark figure, and with a wide brimmed hat, and he would stand or sit at the foot of her bed and just stare at her, and she was scared to death. This happened every single night that she stayed in this house. I think my senior year of school was the worst, I think. was That was the worst. I wouldn't even go home. I just wanted to have a normal life. <sighs> I just can't do this. <laughs> I, I just can't do this. I can't. 
She's the baby, and we always we always treated her as the baby of the family, and so she's really sensitive to a lot of this that's gone on. I know two of it, two incidences that happened with her that un are unbelievable, and she just won't bring them up. The one with the paper, she won't talk about it. One time, she said she had woken up in the middle of the night, and that man was standing at the end of her bed, and she just stood up on her bed and started screaming and yelling and cussing. The next night, it happened again. Before it happened, she wrote on a piece of paper, um, why are you here and why are you doing this to me? And the next morning on the piece of paper, there was a line, a scriggly line across it, and she left the pencil right next to the, to the paper, and it flipped her out. She brought the paper over my house and was showing me, and I was like, oh my God, and that was like the final draw with her. I won't go back, and I haven't gone back, and none of the children will, and I don't blame them. Brian Lyle and his team decide to conduct a formal investigation. The Johnstown House investigation is still really new, but it seems like every time we get here, uh, the paranormal activity is easy to record. Franz reported this swing rocking back and forth. And it keeps moving. The fact is that nobody was sitting in it. And yet, I was standing here waiting for it to stop, and it just kept moving. I've lived in this house for 10 years, and I've never seen nothing like this. The investigators brought in a grave dowser, suspecting the presence of unmarked graves. Something causes the body to, or the hangers to react to what I believe is to be the electromagnetic field that remains with the body even after death. We started checking the yard and found numerous mass graves. It looks like we might have a body here. Okay, you guys, this makes 148 men. We got a cemetery. No way. Um, I didn't expect to find any graves here on this property. It was really a shock. Based on the, the dowsing, we believe this house is sitting actually right in the middle of the cemetery and on top of the graves itself. A noted archaeologist comes to Johnstown to investigate the site. There's a lot of archaeological potential. It's the Colton family had the property before the Civil War. They were here probably as early as the 1850s. The original house here is thought to have been burned during that time in the Civil War, about 1863. And apparently, the Colton family rebuilt this house in 1868. And we have uh, evidence of at least similar, a couple Civil War skirmishes right in this area. So I would expect that you know an archaeological investigation of this would you know re really reveal a lot of you know subsurface remains. For the first time in over a year, the Schilling family returns to the house. I kind of want to be here, and I kind of don't. <laughs> you know, I really wanted to be here because I want to. I would like to see it all be go over. away. It's not funny. It's, so it's scary. scary. I don't want to hear footsteps anymore. I'm sick of hearing doors shutting and footsteps. Before the family even enters the house, paranormal activity begins. Tell your mom what you're hearing. Come in here. equipment and it didn't seem right. All of a sudden, 
sounded like a heartbeat. And we had a heartbeat over by the truck, so we switched out. We went through a couple different microphones, checked every cable. The heartbeat went away, and we kind of laughed, thought no big deal, and it was fine. We came over here, and as soon as we, we surrounded the family, we were getting ready to do our next shot, it came right back. Uh, so I've been doing audio for on and off for 15 years, and I've never heard or seen anything like this. Psychics Joyce Morgan and Misty Mead agreed to help the family walk through their home. Hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hi. Cecilia. This is my I'm husband. Joyce Morgan. I'm Misty. Now it's to the point where nobody wants to come over, nobody wants to be here. I couldn't even get friends to stay the night when I was growing up. Here, they, they, they said the house freaked them out. Yeah. Each of you had an experience, haven't you? Mm -hmm. All of you them. also. Yeah. Right. And you, oh, yes. 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 Ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Get it over. So. <laughs> so. Just so it's warm. Just so it's warm. <laughs> There's a lady in the window. I know. Up here. There's a there's a presence here, but it isn't strong. Not what not what I'm waiting to feel. Mm. We'll start up the steps. Oh, it still isn't the worst. What was that? You heard it? Yes. <laughs> It's all right. It's okay. It's okay. It's fine. She's just glad that we're here, and she's finally getting recognized. And the beef ladies are going to help her. Okay. She's okay. After ten years of this, I don't. Oh Where's she just, at? Where's she? She in front of me? Where is she? No, at? no she's not no. in front of it's you. Okay. She's gone. No. She's gone through the wall and in oh, here. Oh my God. She's all right. You just you stay here with us. What does she want? She's just here. She's yeah. between. Okay. She's between the two worlds. Okay. And she's right going there with me. She's, she's here with me. me. Okay. She's here with me. I feel. Oh. She's all right. Okay. So when somebody going upstairs with me, you can team members. It would sort of just go with me because I don't want to be up here. You just come here. She can't handle it. It's okay, okay Natasha. Here. It's fine. Don't worry about it. There's people downstairs. John's down there. Go to my husband. He's a grounding rod. If you come into a house like this one that has several, and they're strong. Then, then it's it's harder to deal with, and the more we went through, the stronger it got. So the battle is on. Look, I've got a hold of the back of Misty's coat. All the vibrations are this fantastic. Is my See, it's my yeah, you couldn't, okay, you couldn't. Relax. Yeah, this is my old room. The one okay. you couldn't sleep this, in? No, I couldn't. Yeah, either. nobody you couldn't either. This is. Yeah. I was in this is a dwelling place for her. Oh, oh I don't think I want to go in here very bad. Now, this one doesn't have a light that works. No light? Okay, this is Katrina's room. This is the room that collected all the flies. That collected all the flies? Yeah. Did you have somebody touch you in here? Yes. Yeah. Did you have your bed move in here? Yes. 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 What's going on in here? It is, it's just the, the, the feeling, the room is tilted. The room is, the yeah. room is tilted. The room. Right, sure. But it can move your bed, something here. This is where the man spirit comes in. Okay. It and drains it you of your strength. Yes. Yeah. It drains you of your strength. And so let's go on down the hall and, okay. and continue with the rest of the house. Oh, we'll just go out the door here. First. Go ahead. We're going in here. Mm -hmm. right. oh, there's no light even here either. Well, light's not working. Well, well I don't handle this room either. Oh. Oh. So you need to come in here? Who blame her? Well, I'm not going in there. Oh. Sorry. I that. I'm not going in there. No way. Light's not working, and it's about 20 degrees in there. 
the cameraman experiences unexplained problems with his lights. It keeps going. It keeps yeah. going off. It keeps going on off for no reason. For no reason. He's not turning. So we're going. I'm not surprised at all. Well, it's happened. It's been happening for the last 15 minutes. Sun gun just keeps going on and off. For no reason. You know, I. <laughs> You know, equipment can be fickle, but uh, without even moving, it's just going on and on. The rouge. Right. But there's the door that goes out to nowhere. Right. Right here. Right. And um, then this would be... Returning to the house has pushed the Schilling family to their emotional limits. I, I'm to the point now where I, I'm, I'm really fed up. We just want answers. We want to know why all this is going on. Oh, well, there's only one way to really find out if there is graves here and, and there needs to be an excavation in order to prove that beyond a doubt. The search for graves on the property begins. Something here. Over here. Right here. Yeah. What is it? Oh, yeah. I don't know yet. It looks like a bone. Let's see. Let's see. Looks like it's we well, got one, guys. Awesome. We got a yeah. bone. We come across what we believe to be human remains. That's when we notified the authorities. The sheriff's office was contacted and put a halt to all digging. I still... I'm very uneasy about, I don't want to go back there. Not on your life. And until this day, like, you know, I don't want to return. I don't want to be there. Not until the spirits are gone. This is too fresh, and it's too overwhelming, and it's too painful yet. The government has no plans for any further excavations. An all-night confrontation with the unknown can be daunting for anyone. But add to this scenario a confusing maze of darkened halls, strange sounds, and shadows. Ask yourself if you would have what it takes to continue, or would your fears get the best of you? Mission, Lompoc, California. Lompoc was founded on December 8th of 1787 by uh, Padre Presidente Firmin de la Suen. Thousands of Native Americans died in the mission system. The people were taken out of their village settings. It was not by choice. They were uh, taken out as a way of conversion. Because of the cruel punishments that the Indians suffered here, there were times when people just had enough. They were induced to, to rise up finally in a very bloody attempt to reestablish some local control over their lives. Disease was the biggest killer here at the mission. Our cemetery has nearly uh, 4,000 bodies buried in it, but of all the haunted missions, this is the most haunted. My views of, about the supernatural have changed tremendously since being here because I've experienced it firsthand. Uh, I did experience an apparition in one of the rooms in, uh, in this building. I can't deny that I saw it. It was frightening. You know, I saw what I perceived to be a, a padre sitting on the edge of the bed one night and he got up and followed me around as I did some work. We had a dowsing crew come in. One woman was seized by some invisible force. Her whole body flipped. She flung back like this with her legs and her arms and her head forward. She hit the door so hard that her head ricocheted off the door. And she says, it has me. Well, she had a pair of dowsing rods. Both the rods were bent from the force of that. She was a quivering mass. I think these spirits, out of anger, could remain here. Seven students agreed to investigate La Purissima's paranormal activity. La Purissima is perfect as a test bed for our investigations. You may well encounter ghosts, phantoms, or maybe even a portal into other times or other dimensions. I have a variety of tools. Any of you have seen these items? 
These are called divining rods or dowsing rods. Where you find a psychic disturbance is where they're gonna cross. This is a simple elf meter. It was originally designed to detect electromagnetic radiation. If you ever are scanning an area with this device and it reads caution, or especially if they're in the red zone, that means it's hot. As night falls, the students meet medium, Pam Gagan. Why I was invited here tonight was to lead you in a seance. And the seance is to open the portals or the avenues for the spirits to appear to you tonight. Feel the presence of this place and the energy of this place and the opening of all those who have lived and died. And then with this portal open, I ask that all of the spirits come from that time to visit us. The students split up to search for evidence of spirit activity. Corey and Rain are left alone in the old prison. What do I do? Okay, just um, aim the camera at me and actually hold the flashlight too. Are you here? Oh my god. Ah! Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Okay, all right. Hey. Oh my god. Wait, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. All right, let me film you for a second. Okay. Okay. I just heard somebody in the doorway. Yeah? It sounded like they wanted to get out or come in or something. I don't know. What, 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 how, how are you feeling right now? Okay. What the hell was that? Okay. What are you feeling right now? I'm feeling very scared. There was, there was definitely something in here. In the cemetery, Tony, Karen, and Rosanna read the Lord's Prayer in native Chumash. Dios, Kaskosko, Upalekwen, Alapai, Kia, Inicho, Opte, Etchuje, Katarak. Oh, it's just a field mouse. I'm just. I just heard something. Let's hear something drop. Just go first. Stay up. Eat up. Oh my god. Kim and Ryan investigate the old Padre's room. in the prison, Rain remains in the chamber, alone. Okay, basically I'm sitting here and alone in where the prison used to be. And I'm feeling a very, very cold chill right now. Mm -hmm. Dragging sound. It really, really freaked me out. 
kind of scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> yeah, I felt the same way. I felt like we shouldn't have been there. Like, I just felt the weirdest sensations. I, I, I didn't feel like I was out of place, but I felt like, like, just, just, just sensations you just can't explain. I really felt like there was something in there that wanted to like talk or communicate like with me. Room made me nervous. I'll just put it that way. Room made me nervous. Terrified by what they've encountered, the students asked them to close the portal. So we know that right here and right now, all spirits out of sight and out of sound are released into the night. And all spirits are now released to go to their resting place. We blow out the candle. One, two, three. Spirits are back and at rest. Ula mogo, ila, ulao sa ko u, steke yo ponatsiani yo uku ayemog. Kana kuai, kui, kuai. I think that if you perceive a veil between the other side and this side, that the veil here at, at La Parisma is very thin. Amen. Palermo, Sicily is not a place where you would expect to find 8,000 mummified corpses. But deep inside Palermo's Capuchin catacombs are the remnants of a bizarre and secretive process used to preserve the dead for eternity. Some have never been photographed. Most appear here on television for the very first time. Sicily. The Capuchin Catacombs, four centuries of death on display. I wouldn't go down there unless you want to have nightmares for the rest of your life. I warn you, don't go down there. We have noticed that everyone who comes here leaves changed forever. Those are real bodies. of over 8,000 souls line the corridors of the catacombs. When they first built this monastery, one of the problems that came up was what to do with the dead. Remember at the time it was important to the living to face the dead. And this visual reminder helped them reflect on their own mortality. The Capuchin order believed strongly that the body should be preserved for the coming resurrection. And they developed a highly successful mummification process. And although Capuchin relics can be seen throughout Italy, nowhere was the process more successful or more popular than it is here in Palermo. The secret to the embalming process is hidden in the depths of the catacombs. This is one of the 30 drying chambers. In here, on these large grills, there is room for six or seven corpses. The room was sealed for eight months while the corpses drained. Then they were washed with vinegar and stuffed with straw. Finally, they were dressed in their clothes and placed in the corridors of the catacombs. The catacombs were initially reserved for the monks, but later extended to dignitaries and patrons of the church. The corpses were carefully organized by class, gender, and age.
history, the catacombs have spawned many legends. During the Black Plague in Palermo, 40 monks were seen walking in procession in the middle of the night. When the Father Superior was asked why he had sent the monks out, he was amazed. No monks, he said, had left the monastery the night before. The people then understood that saints were buried in the catacombs and that they had manifested as spirits to do penance for the city in hopes of ending the plague. Mummification of the bodies stopped in 1860 when the process was outlawed by a Napoleonic decree. However, the catacombs received their most cherished saint in 1920 when the body of a little girl was brought in by her family. She had been mummified by a secret process which to this day remains a mystery even to the Capuchin monks. Up until recently, Rosalia's sister often came from Rome to visit her. She hadn't been able to create a relationship with Rosalia in life. In the catacombs, she was able to be touched by her in death. Among the visitors that come down into the catacombs, some people come unprepared and they have to turn back quickly because the experience is too upsetting. But I think for everybody, you can't come to the catacombs without being faced by the profound and personal question of who we are in life and the inescapable mystery that is awaiting all of us at the end of our lives. So what is it that makes a place scary? Is it a threatening presence that drives you from your home? The knowledge that horrible torture has occurred in a location? Or is it someone whispering from the grave? For some, it is not what can be seen, but what cannot, the unknown. I'm Linda Blair. Good night.